Hello and welcome. This is an audio video excerpt of material from Integrative Medicine and Functional Medicine for Chronic Hypertension. The complete video is available at OptimalHealthResearch.com. The entire functional and integrative medicine approach is detailed in the textbook Integrative Medicine and Functional Medicine for Chronic Hypertension, available from OptimalHealthResearch.com, Amazon.com, and other bookstores. A very important cause of hypertension is Kahn syndrome, more generally known as primary hyperaldosteronism. This is a common problem caused by a unilateral adrenal adenoma or bilateral adrenal hyperplasia. This condition accounts for approximately 6% of adult hypertension and 10 to 20% of cases of treatment resistant hypertension. Classic findings are treatment resistant hypertension. Uh, with hypokalemia, but only 30% of affected patients have the characteristic hypokalemia. Laboratory diagnosis is made to the extent that it can be made by finding an elevated serum uh, aldosterone to renin ratio greater than 20. Ideally, this test is done when the patient's been off drugs that affect the renin angiotensin system uh, for four to six weeks. The drugs that they should specifically avoid uh, would include thiazide diuretic ACE inhibitors, uh, angiotensin agonists, also known as ARBs, and beta blockers. The diagnosis is typically confirmed by an endocrinologist performing a salt suppression test. Uh, CT scanning is insensitive for detecting microadenomas and milder degrees of glandular hyperplasia. Curative treatment is lac laparoscopic removal or resection of the hypersecreting adrenal tumor. For patients who are not surgical candidates, drug treatment with an aldosterone blocking drug such as spironolactone or eplerinone, of course, can be used. The next cause of hypertension that we'll consider is renal artery stenosis. We're going to focus on two main causes, the first of which is atherosclerosis. This is seen mostly in older adults over the age of 50, particularly those with clinically significant cardiovascular disease risk factors such as smoking, dyslipidemia, and or already established uh, peripheral vascular disease. Ninety percent of renal artery stenosis is caused by atherosclerosis. Fibromuscular dysplasia is a cause of renal artery stenosis, especially in the younger populations uh, under age 40. Women are affected much more commonly than are men. Clinically, what we see with renal artery stenosis, regardless of the underlying cause, uh, is an elevation in potassium, BUN, and or creatinine following administration of an ACE inhibitor or and ARB, angiotensin receptor blocker. We might also notice a high-pitched holosystolic renal artery brewery on careful physical examination. Gold standard for diagnosis is uh, catheter, catheter angiography. Ultrasonography can also be used even though it's less sensitive. Magnetic resonance angiography without contrast has become progressively more accurate and can rival contrast enhanced techniques. And obviously this would be the assessment of choice because it doesn't include a uh, nephrotoxic contrast agent. Treatment options for renal artery stenosis, uh, usually these are surgical treatment options for uh, fibromuscular dysplasia and pharmaceutical management for patients with atherosclerosis. Renal parenchymal disease or renal parenchymal disease leads to what we call nephrogenic hypertension. Uh, renal disease can lead to and result from hypertension. Kidney diseases are the most common cause of hypertension in childhood. We need to consider glomerulonephritis, congenital abnormalities, and reflux nephropathy. The clinical picture commonly includes edema, elevated BUN and creatinine, and proteinuria, anemia due to insufficient production of erythropoietin, and uh, in more advanced and chronic cases, osteomalacia and osteodystrophy. Laboratory indication from this, again, based on the serum creatinine and other clinical variables, specifically the patient's age, uh, we can plug this information into various uh, equations, one of the more popular and widely used of which is the cockcroft galt formula, which I'll show you on the next slide. Uh, what we do here is we factor in primarily uh, serum creatinine, uh, also weight, gender, and the patient's age. And from that, we get an estimate of their glomerular filtration rate. Based on that estimate of their, their glomerular filtration rate, we can tell to what extent they either are or are not in 
renal insufficiency. A, another relatively newer formula that can be used uh, to assess renal function based on serum creatinine in the patient's age primarily is what's called the modification of diet in renal disease study equation. This is the MDRD study equation, which is available online at the link that I've provided you here. Another serum laboratory marker that can be used is called cystatin C. It's a rel relatively newer test, and it's more specific for renal insufficiency than is creatinine. So probably what we'll see over the next couple of years is that the cystatin C becomes more widely used and therefore less expensive, and then based on its decreased cost, it'll become more widely used. So clinicians do need to be aware of, of this test as it will probably uh, hit the primary care horizon within the next few years. Diagnosis of renal-induced hypertension is further verified and refined by the use of CT scan, MRI, and ultrasound imaging. Of course, we can follow this up with a renal biopsy if necessary. This slide shows the cockcroft galt equation, uh, which is uh, mainly factored, again, by the patient's age and years, the weight in kilograms and their gender, uh, divided by their serum creatinine. So uh, the complete equation is 140 minus age and years times weight in kilograms times 0 0.85 if the patient's female. This is divided by uh, the denominator, which is 72 times the serum creatinine level in milligrams per deciliter. This gives us the uh, estimated glomerular filtration rate, which we can then use to help um, monitor and treat our patients based on uh, how we interpret this and how we uh, act on the numbers that we get. I'll show you this information on the next slide. When the glomerular filtration rate re reaches below 60, we refer to this as chronic kidney disease stage 3. We modify doses and or withdraw certain medications. When the GFR is below 30, this is called uh, chronic kidney disease stage 4. Uh, I typically refer the patient at that point to a kidney specialist. Uh, and when the GFR is below 15, uh, at that point, patients in end-stage renal disease, and they certainly need uh, to be um, connected with services that can provide either transplant and or dialysis. Obstructive sleep apnea is a risk factor for hypertension, and treatment for obstructive sleep apnea with continuous positive uh, airway pressure, also known as a CPAP, can produce modest reductions in blood pressure. Diagnosis of sleep apnea is generally by history and physical exam confirmed with an overnight sleep study, referred to as polysomnography, or in some cases a nocturnal pulse oximetry might also be used. The latter is uh, less expensive but also uh, clinically accurate. Hypertension in general and treatment-resistant hypertension in particular are seen in systemic sclerosis a disease in which cardiopulmonary disease, specifically pulmonary hypertension, congestive heart failure, and renal compromise, acute renal crisis, uh, are the most common causes of death. And the history and physical exam could reveal uh, clues such as Renaud's phenomenon, sclerodactyly, mask-like face, telangiectasia, and esophageal dysfunction. As far as laboratory findings, typically some combination of positive antinuclear antibodies, anti-centromere antibodies, anti-SCL-70 antibodies, and more, rare, more rarely the anti-fibrillarin antibodies. Treatment for scleroderma and other common autoimmune disorders is covered in my book, uh, Integrative Rheumatology. Another common clinical condition that we see, which can also contribute to hypertension, is thyroid disease. And here, of course, we're including both hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism generally causes uh, diastolic hypertension, wh while hyperthyroidism generally causes systolic hypertension and the accompanying widened pulse pressure. The assessment of hypothyroidism uh, begins, of course, clinically. We look at pulse rate, we look at physical exam, we look at weight loss, weight gain. We look at the Achilles reflex return speed, 
and we look at body temperature. Uh, and we, of course, look at laboratory testing as well. To diagnose hypothyroidism, I would certainly be glad to accept uh, just about any of the following as criteria. An elevated TSH, a low free T4, elevated titers of antithyroid antibodies, uh, whether these are antithyroid peroxidase or antithyroid globulin. According to a relatively recent issue of the Merck manual, probably um, about 10 years ago or so, uh, the Merck manual had, had concluded that even if the patient isn't clinically hypothyroid, if they have antithyroid antibodies, it's still appropriate to treat those patients because they'll go on later to develop uh, overt thyroid disease. A low free T3 or a low total T3 would also be a uh, reason to supplement someone uh, with thyroid hormone to um, try to provide clinical improvement if there aren't any contraindications to that treatment. An elevated reverse T3 and or a ratio of total T3 to reverse T3 less than 10, I would also consider that to be an um, indicator of what I refer to as peripheral or metabolic hypothyroidism. It's, it's hypothyroidism that's not due to glandular failure. It's due to reduced peripheral conversion of T4 to T3. So those patients also uh, benefit from treatment. So again, we need to think of, uh, as I mentioned previously, we need to think of thyroid disease as a cause of hypertension, uh, whether it's hypothyroidism or hyper, hyperthyroidism, hypo or hyper, both of those conditions can cause high blood pressure, and the diagnosis of both of them is also relatively straightforward. Beginning with clinical exam, of course, the history, complete history, and uh, doing the required lab tests. Related to what I had mentioned earlier as central neurogenic hypertension, we need to consider upper cervical spine dysfunction and subluxation as a potential cause of hypertension as well. There was a very remarkable uh, clinical trial published in Journal of Human Hypertension in 2007 which showed that correction of upper cervical spine subluxation or dysfunction by chiropractic spinal manipulation could cause marked and sustained reductions in blood pressure similar to the use of two-drug combination therapy. Again, this was published in the Journal of Human Hypertension 2007 uh, in May. Uh, this was volume 21, page 347. So uh, this is a very paradigm-shifting, powerful article that again showed that patients who were treated with upper cervical spine manipulation uh, received marked reductions in their blood pressure as a result of that treatment. Therefore, the only logical conclusion would be that it was a therapeutic intervention that caused the reduction and more specifically that it was some type of correction of other upper cervical spine anatomy, uh, biomechanics, uh, or again, just the static anatomy of the uh, bones and joints in relation to each other. Um, in ways that haven't been completely elucidated, this was corrected by chiropractic spinal manipulation. And again, per the quote here, led to marked and sustained reductions in blood pressure similar to the use of two drug combination therapy. In closing, I want to thank you for participating in this presentation on the differential diagnosis of hypertension and other aspects of its uh, clinical presentation and the complex nature of this common clinical entity with socioeconomic uh, implications as well. Again, my name is Alex Vasquez. I am the author of Integrative Medicine and Functional Medicine for Chronic Hypertension. More information about this textbook and other health conditions can be found at OptimalHealthResearch.com.